going to read the first seven verses of Romans chapter 13. And Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. And beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. And tonight we're going to start something. It's probably going to, probably I'm looking at maybe five or six weeks, four or five, somewhere in the vicinity on what the Bible has to say about civil disobedience. And the reason, then we'll get to the reason that after I pray. We're going to pray and then I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the reasoning behind it and then we'll get into what the Bible has to say about this very important subject. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for tonight. And I thank you, Lord, for giving to us uh, a structure as, as we see in, even go back in the Old Testament, we see, Lord, that it was your design after the flood for man to have Oh, some form of rule that brought in law and order into a society that beforehand had none. And how that has helped us in our society to be a moral society. But Father, we do know that not everything that happens in society is moral and right. And as we as Christians look at the world around us, help us to see it with biblical eyes and help us to interpret the world through the filter of the Bible so that we may make godly decisions in our own lives, even in a world that is completely upside down so often. So Lord, we ask now as we look at your word and, and consider what you have to say about this over the next few weeks, that you would grant us the wisdom to understand your word the way you would have us do, and then the courage to do what we understand. Thank you again for tonight. And we ask your blessing upon it in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, this, this idea came to me about three or four years ago. A friend of mine and I were talking about uh, government. And we were talking about uh, American government. We were talking about voting. We were talking about politicians. We were talking about a lot of di different things. And we were talking about the revolution and, and American history. And uh, we, we discussed a lot of different ideas, a lot of different things, and he's the type of person that he and I could talk about just about anything and walk away and our opinion of each other doesn't change one bit. Isn't that a wonderful thing? When you can have the liberty to talk to someone about anything and you know when you walk away that your friendship hasn't changed one bit, no matter how you all see things. Because sometimes we don't feel that way. Sometimes you walk away from somebody and think, good night, I don't know if they still like me after that. <laughs> so it's nice to have that liberty. And after we talked and I, it was about three, it was about four years ago, I began thinking about what the Bible has to say about the Christian's responsibility towards government and towards authority that we have in our lives. And I started studying it about three or four years ago, and then I put that aside and thought, that'd be great to come back to someday. Not knowing that we would be living in the world we're living in now, where everything's kind of just blown up. And you look around and see what's going on in the world. It's absolutely crazy, especially in our country, where we have riots, we have people that are assaulting police officers, we have, uh, we have cities that are uh, taking money away from police officers, we have school districts that are are, are, are stripping police officers of the contracts that they have with them to secure their schools. Some cities are doing the same thing. 
We have out west, we have people assaulting a federal building or you know, destroying federal property, and we have federal uh, uh, military in different cities right now to protect federal property. It's just, things are just insane around the country in a lot of ways. And so when it comes to this topic, I want to approach it from a biblical perspective. I'm a, I'm a Christian first. I'm a Christian first. No matter where I go in the world, I will be a Christian. First and foremost. And as a Christian, my responsibility toward God is to understand the Bible that's His revealed will and then live my life according to what the Bible teaches me as a Christian to do. No matter what's going on in the world. If there's peace in the world, I want to live my life by the Bible. If there's turmoil in the world, I want to live my life by the Bible. So the Bible has to be the foundation for what it is I do. But as we see all that's going on with, with, the, with civil disobedience, with riots, with protesting and everything, um, uh, many conversations, many people have had on their mind is what, where is that as far as what the Bible tells us we as Christians are supposed to do. So tonight, I want to start that conversation by looking at what the Bible says and then over the next few weeks, move forward with that thought. See, when it comes to a question like, is civil disobedience ever justified for a Christian, we have to answer a few questions and define a few things before we can answer that question. So that, that question is like, should a Christian participate in a riot, in a protest? Should a Christian ever disobey the law? Should a Christian ever stand, okay, should a Christian not pay taxes if they disagree with what the government does? Those types of things have been questions for a long time, but the society we're living in now have kind of pushed them into our face because we're living in a society now where that's becoming a major part of our society. What do we do with it? So we're going to start to answer that question and start to unravel that from the Bible's perspective. And let's always keep in mind it is the Bible that we must follow as a Christian. That is what we're bound to first and foremost. So before we get into that, answering the question of whether or not civil disobedience is ever justified for a Christian and what it means and how to do that, we should first define what civil disobedience is. Civil disobedience was a term that was coined by a man by the name of Henry Thoreau in 1848. Talking about a little bit ago, about 150, 160, almost 170 years ago. Thoreau lived at a time before the Civil War, when slavery was still very much a fabric of our society. Thoreau had refused to pay a poll tax because he knew that the money that the government would take from the tax would go to help support the Mexican-American War. And he disagreed with slavery. But before we understand his decision, we have to understand his mindset, and then we can kind of start to unravel that as far as what the Bible has to say. Thoreau was a lecturer, he was a teacher, and he was a writer on government and government philosophy and our responsibility to government. And he wrote an essay which became to be known as Civil Disobedience. I have it at, my, at the house. I have a copy of his essay at my house. And uh, I haven't read it, but <laughs> it's sitting on the shelf is one of the things I, I intend to read at some point. In it, Thoreau argues that government is a machine. And every citizen is a part of that machine. And that machine is producing something. And when every part of that, every part of that machine is what it's supposed to be, then that machine will produce what is right. But as things start to go wrong and the machine starts producing what's wrong, his philosophy was that as part of that machine, we're responsible for what it's producing. That was his philosophy. So, for example, we are, we are Americans. So in Thoreau's mind, as Americans, whatever America does is because of us. Therefore, we are responsible for what's going on. So his philosophy was, if the machine is doing wrong, then it's up to the parts of the machine to stand up to the machine to change what it's doing so it does what's right. That was his philosophy. So he's, he defined civil disobedience as this. And this is important. I'll repeat it. A couple times. He defines civil disobedience as a public, nonviolent, and conscientious breach of law 
that is undertaken with the aim of bringing about change in law or government policy. Again, it's a public, nonviolent, conscientious, meaning very purposeful, breaking of the law in order to bring about change from your government. That's what civil disobedience is. He went on to explain that on this account, people who engage in civil disobedience are willing to accept the legal consequences of their actions because this shows that they believe in the rule of law. A good example of this would be Martin Luther King, who purposefully violated laws that he considered to be unjust, nonviolently, and was put in jail for doing it. He was willing to pay the punishment of law because he believed in the rule of law, but he was willing to face the punishment of law to disobey what he believed was unjust. Does that make sense? We're all together? Okay. That is what civil disobedience is. Civil disobedience is not rioting in the streets and breaking and destroying and burning things. That is not civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is not disrupting other people uh, by blocking freeways so they can't get to where it is they need to go. That is not civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is a public, nonviolent, but very purposeful, conscientious break, breach of law, meaning if the government tells you to do something or tells you you can't, you don't comply. So that you will affect change, but you're willing to accept whatever legal repercussions come from doing that. So the question is, is that ever acceptable for a Christian or warranted for a Christian? <laughs> There's a very short answer, and there's a very long answer. <laughs> Tonight we're going to do the short answer, but we're going to build into it by building a foundation, and then we'll answer that question. So before I answer that question, let's lay a foundation, build upon it, and keep these things in mind as we look to the Bible to answer those questions for us. So let's look back in Romans chapter 13, and then we're going to build a foundation. I'm going to answer the question, but I'll answer it at the end here. Romans chapter 13, that's like, that's like a TV show. Stay tuned, and you might find out at the very end what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Romans chapter, means you can sleep till the end, and you'll be good. Uh, no, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Let's read it here. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a tear to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Now, to understand this, we have to define what power is in the Bible. The word power in the Bible comes from about four different Greek words, but there are two main words that are used in the Bible in the Greek language that are translated power. The first word is the word dunamis, and it means ability. It's the word we get dynamite from. Okay, you think of power, dynamite, you blow something up, it has the ability to make something happen. That's one word that's translated power in the Bible. So you'll see that sometimes, uh, the word power, and it just means the ability to make something happen, okay? That's what that means. Um, and like when Jesus said, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, that word is the word dunamis, it's dynamite. What he's saying is the Holy Spirit comes on you, something's going to happen that you'll be able to do that you weren't able to do before. That's what that means, okay? But then there's another main word, second main word, is the word excelsia. And it doesn't mean ability, it means authority. Okay? So the two main words are dunamis, which means dynamite, or when we get the word dynamite from that, means the power to do. And then um, excelsia is authority, and it means, the, it, it means the power to affect, but you're not the one necessarily the one doing it. 
Okay? So ability and authority are the two different words translated as power. In this passage, verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher power, for there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. In verse 3, where it says, Wilt thou not be afraid of the power? That is the word excelsior, and it means authority. Does not mean ability, it means authority. Now, a person can have an ability to do something and not have the authority to do it. On the other hand, someone can have the authority to do something and not have the ability to get anything done. Right? They're not the same thing. In this passage, it is the word authority which God is talking about. What it's saying here is every person is supposed to be subject to the authority that is over them. And that there is no authority but of God. The authority that is, is because of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the authority, doesn't just resist the authority, but resists God's very ordinance. And those that resist the ordinance of God shall receive damnation. Then it goes on to ask the question, or it goes on to say, um, here in verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to the good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou not then be afraid of the authority? Wilt thou not be afraid? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So he's talking about authority. He's talking about people that have power in position over other people. What this passage is saying is all authority comes from God. It is not saying that every position in the world was created by God. God didn't, you can read through the Bible and you will not see a place where God said, okay, there needs to be a president and there needs to be a Supreme Court and there needs to be legislative. Okay, God didn't create the positions. God created authority, though. The very concept of authority, the very reason authority exists is because God exists. That's the whole reason. It came from God. Now, we may choose the people that go into office, and God has a sovereign will as well. And we may elect people, or we may live in a country where we have no choice whatsoever. But the idea is here that authority itself comes from God. Authority exists because God is the one who designed it to exist. Now, what does that mean, though? What does the word authority mean? We think of authority as position. We think of authority as influence and power over others. Well, let me give you the definition, and then we'll, it'll explain where we're going and the foundation that we need to build off of for the next few weeks. The word authority comes from the English word author. 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 Like a book writer. When we think of an author, we usually think of someone who's given us a book, someone who's written a book. And that is a type of author. That's not only what that word means, though. The word author literally means the originator, the creator, the instigator, the captain, the producer, the founder, the leader, the settler, the one who settles the issues. That's what an author is. So the author creates, an author makes, an author brings something into being that wasn't there originally. That's what an author is. And because he is an author, a creator, an originator, he has authority over what he has created. That's what that means. God is the creator of everything. God authored, if you will, everything into existence. How did he do it? By the very word of his mouth. God said, let there be, and there was. Before that, there wasn't anything but God. God said, let there be light. There was light. God said, let there be uh, a firmament in the heaven. There was a firmament in the heaven. God said, let there be uh, let there be trees that grow out of the ground. He said, let the waters be gathered in one place. Let dry ground appear. And it was so. God said, let there be forth herb yielding seed and tree yielding fruit. And everything that exists, God authored it into existence. And because God authored it into existence, God then is the authority authority of everything. Does that make sense? You can follow what I'm saying? God bring up into existence and by the very right of existence or creation, God is now the authority.
authority over what he authored. It's no different in our own lives. When we make something, when we create something, and we bring it into existence, we are the author of it, and therefore it belongs to us. Therefore, we have the authority over what it is we create. That is the concept there. That is the idea there. Everything that comes into being by something, that person is the author and therefore the authority of it. If I make a business, and I'm the founder of that business, don't I have the right to do with that business what I want to do with that business so long as I'm not violating the laws of the land? It's my business. Do what I want with it. If I get, if I have a piece of property, I buy a piece of property and I on that piece of property are some trees, and I cut those trees down, and I make something with that wood. I created that, and by very right of creation, don't I have then the authority to do with it what I will? If I want to give it away, I give it away. If I want to sell it, I sell it. If I want to stick it in my house, I stick it in my house. Why? Because I made it. That's why. And as long as I'm not violating the laws of the land, I can do what I will with what I make. Because I'm the one who instigated it. I created it. That's what authority is. And since God authored everything, God brought in authority because of his right of creation. Everything answers to God. Everything does. The stars do. The planets do. The waters, the seas, the trees. We can read it in the Bible. The heavens declare the glory of God. Why? He created them. That's why. He's the author of them. They were subject to his very will. The animals, God created them. They do what God wants them to do. I love the donkey in the story of Balaam. God opened up the donkey's mouth and it spoke. Why? God let it. Why? Because he has authority over it. Love that. The donkey's like, what you doing, man? <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. It's crazy. The very laws of physics that control everything around us are not God. God put them into place. If God wants to do with the laws of physics, what God wants to do with the law, He can. Why? He created them. Do what He wants. He's the author of everything. Now, as the author, God has told us some things about Himself. He's told me He doesn't. He told us He doesn't change. He told us that He's ever existent, never eternal. He told us that His word, He will never violate His word, ever. So we have some idea of who God is, but he is the author of everything. He has authority over everything. Now, as such, God explains through this concept two different types of authority. The first is inherent, and the second is delegated. And I'll explain what that means. Inherent authority is what I was just explaining. Inherent authority is the authority something has because it created something else. He made it, he built it, someone makes it and builds it and built something and authors it into existence. They are the one who has authority over that thing. And our country even understands that by creating copyright laws. What are copyright laws for? They're to protect what people create because they are the owner, they are the author. So we go to the government and say, can you protect what it is I created? And the government says, yes, we can. That's what that's all about. You brought it into existence? Fine, we'll protect your right of it because you own it. You're the author. That's inherent authority. You have inherent authority because of what you create. The second is delegated authority. Delegated authority is the authority given to somebody to fulfill a responsibility. Delegated authority is the authority that is handed out by an author to someone else who has a responsibility to fulfill. For example, in a business, somebody makes a business. They are the author of that business. They brought it into being, and therefore they have the authority over that business. Subject to government laws, obviously, and we'll get into that in the future lesson as to why that is the way it is, but he has authority to do as he wills. For example, I worked up at Fermano Food in, in Northumberland for a few years. Whoever founded that business was the person who had the authority to do whatever he wanted. If he wanted to can tomatoes, they can tomatoes. The owner comes in and says, we're changing it all tomorrow. We're canning beans now. Guess what we're going to do? It's your business, man. 
People could tell him, hey man, you built your business on tomatoes and you're changing everything up. You can run your business into the ground. Guess what? He can say, it doesn't matter. I found it and I can do with it what I want. Now the owner has the inherent authority. The delegated authority is when he gives authority to someone else to do a responsibility. So let's say the business grows and Fermanos employs several hundred people there. A few hundred. I think it was 1,200 or something like that. And so it gets beyond the owner's ability to run everything. So what he does is he hires a manager to come in and manage a section of the business. Who is the author of that business? The owner's the author. He has, an, he has authority by right of design. But if he hires somebody to do a job and to fulfill a responsibility, he gives to that person the authority to do it. And that person has what's called delegated authority. He's, that manager's not inherently the authority. He didn't create the business. But he has authority by right of the owner giving him that authority. The owner says, you come in and you tell everybody here what they're going to do. Now, there are only two people that can tell everyone what to do. The owner and the manager. Because the owner, by right of authority, has authority over the business. The manager's been given his authority by the owner. Does that make sense? You follow me? So you have the inherent authority of the owner, and then you have the delegated authority of the manager, but they both have authority in what it is they do. But the manager's authority is to do a particular job. The owner's authority is to control the business. So the manager can't come in and tell the owner, listen. Now, if the owner tells him, you know, do things as you desire in these areas, he can. But if the manager comes in and says, listen, I'm running the show here now. The owner can say, I can fire you, and I'll find another manager. Our country does the same thing. This is a very similar idea. The founding fathers brought about a constitutional republic. And by right of creation, they could do whatever they desired with our country. Now they brought in, there were, there were quite a number of people that debated it. There were quite a number of people that put together the structure of our nation, the Constitution, if you will. And the Constitution created, in a sense, the people created a Constitution that authored in our form of government. The Congress and the Senate today was not a creation of the Founding Fathers. The, con the Constitution was. The Congress and the Senate was a creation of the Constitution. Constitution authored in that Congress and the Senate were came from. The presidency, where did it come from? Constitution. Tells us exactly how it's going to work. All of these things, though, they created a system that authored in a system that then delegated authority to different positions. What is Congress's job in our republic? They make laws. That's the only job they're supposed to have, according to the Constitution. We can talk about that another time. What is the court system's responsibility? He created a court system and gave authority to the courts. And what is the court's responsibility? It's to interpret the laws that Congress makes. It's a responsibility. Therefore, they have the authority to do that. But that's it. The courts can't create police societies and go around and police everybody because that's not they don't have the authority to do that. It created a, an executive branch consisting of the president and those who work for the president. What's their job with the executive branch? To execute the laws that the Congress makes and that the justice system interprets. That's the, whole, that's the way it works. So this authority was authored in and then delegated to people to fulfill a responsibility. That's what it's for. Let me give you one more. And then I'm going to push these other points to next week and we'll continue on. Let me ask you all a question. Who created the family? Where did it come from? When did it, when did it get created? If you think about the Bible, when it happened? Way back, a long time ago. I mean, it must have been at least 30 or 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's created by God, right? Yes. It was created in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says God uh, formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I can attest that it is not good. <laughs> you wouldn't want to visit my home if I lived. <laughs> it would be a wreck. 
is not good for man to be alone, right? God said, I'll make him a help meet for him. So God formed uh, a deep sleep came upon Adam. God took the rib out of the man, and from the rib he made a woman, brought him unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall become a woman because she was made, made out of the man. And the Bible says that Adam said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave in his wife. These two shall become one flesh. Then it says, and they were both naked in the garden, the man and his wife. Go. God created that. So who authored the family? God. Who has authority over the family? By right of authorship, it's God. So a lot of families are having trouble because they've lost sight of the fact that God's the one that made it in the first place, and He's the authority over the family. This idea that anybody can be, and it's not, it's God. Because He created it. Then God delegated. And the woman and the man sinned. God told the woman, Thy desire shall be unto thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So God delegated authority to the man to fulfill a responsibility to his family. That's the family structure. God, by right of ownership, he created the family. It was his to do with whatever he wanted with it. Then God delegated authority to the man. And then God said, children, obey your parents. So what did he do? He delegated authority to both. He said, here, you have authority over your children for the responsibility of bringing your children up to the Lord. That's how it works. There's another one. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm close. Who created the church? Where did it come from? Yeah, that was about 20 years ago, right? God created the church. <laughs> Family's about 40. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, God created the church. So by right of ownership, God is the authority. What does the Bible tell us? Christ is the head of the church. Why? Because he created it. That's why. It's his. By right of ownership, this is God's. God can do whatever he wants with it. Now, God has told us in the Bible how to handle things because he's left it to us to follow his word. But that's how authority works. Authority is right of ownership. I made it. I have, I'm the authority over it. And then if I need someone to fulfill a responsibility, I take and I delegate them authority, and they have a responsibility. And they have authority over their responsibility. Now we'll get into this a little bit more next week. And well, I'm going to answer the question, though. I said I answer the question. So the question is, in this structure... Is it ever okay to disobey the authority you have over you? And is it ever okay to disobey civilly the government? The short answer is yes. That's a very short answer. It's a very, very, very short. The long answer starts next week. When we built a foundation, though. We have to understand before we ever say yes, we must first understand where authority came from in the first place. We have to understand God created it all, and therefore he has the right to do with it as he pleases. As the author, he has authority. Anyone who creates something as the author has authority. And then when there are responsibilities to fulfill, the author says to somebody, you have the authority to do this responsibility, you have the authority to do that responsibility, you have the authority to do that responsibility. So next week we're going to look a little bit more at how that responsibility divides up, how authority should act, and then we're going to move into how we as Christians should react when authority doesn't do what they're supposed to do. And it's very important. Because when we have that foundation, we can understand what we're supposed to do. I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll, I'll say this in closing. You're not going to see me out there riding on the streets. Because I don't believe that's what we're supposed to do. But there may be times in the future where as Christians, we have to stand and make some very, very very difficult decisions like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego we will not bow like Daniel, I'm going to pray you're not going to stop me, I'm going to pray like the disciples after they were whipped and told never speak again in Jesus name, they said we have to obey God rather than man they didn't riot they didn't loot, they didn't protest they just did what they knew was right and we'll get on to all that. We'll, we'll get to that. Anyway, I'm a little long tonight. <laughs>